Good morning, everyone. We're continuing with our roadmap for right living based on the 52 qualities in Swami's wonderful book, Affirmations for Self-Healing. So let us begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dear friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to feel your living presence that we may act in this world always as your instruments. Guide us through the maze of delusions and desires and reactions to the calm center of our oneness with thee. We long to live in the light, open the way, that our deepest desires may be fulfilled. Om peace. Amen. When I speak of our deepest desires, I mean our deepest desire for God-realization. I'm not praying that all our worldly desires be fulfilled. Although fulfillment is helpful because once a desire is fulfilled, you understand just how much it can bring you and just how much it doesn't bring you. That's ultimately how we come to peace with this world. It does. We don't come to peace with it when we're constantly telling ourselves that it's ugly and I don't want it. God knows there is enough suffering in this world and that is also an incentive but we have we also have <clears throat> deep refined desires that are not <coughs> in themselves dark but the reality is simply even when we drink that cup to the bottom to the dregs um it still doesn't fulfill because the heart is restless till it finds its rest in the as St. Augustine put it. But we learn from being thwarted, Swami said, but we learn more from being fulfilled. Because if we're thwarted, we always have an imaginary idea that if I only had this, then I would be perfectly happy. But when we have this, then we realize that I'm happy, but I'm not perfectly happy. Because there's that part of ourselves that can only be fulfilled by God-realization. So, (laughs) excuse me, today we're working on work, and we have read the first two paragraphs, which I'll just read again, and then we'll do the third one. Work should be done with a creative attitude, never for the sake of selfish gain, but for the chance it gives us to help create a better world. I realized when I saw this creative attitude, I'm, I'm not sure I made that clear enough when I was speaking about it, because sometimes there is nothing more creative we can do with a job. It's just straightforward. There's no fancy ways about it. It just has to be done. As I was saying, also, every job has its tedium. Every, every life has its tedious parts. You know, I, I live in this house. I, I do laundry. I wash dishes. I go grocery shopping. I cook. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. It's just life. It just requires these things that we have to do just to keep it running. And there's, you can do it. There's only a certain point beyond which you can't innovate. It just has to be faced. So the creativity is not always in the actual change in the way you do something. It's a creative attitude. And the creative attitude is every moment is new. Instead of looking to the past or agonizing over the future, we, we live creatively in the moment. This, this moment has never come before and will never come again. My opportunity to feel God's presence within me, to practice japa, to chant to myself, to pray to others, to celebrate the gifts in my life, to face courageously the tests that I have, it will never come again. That's the creativity. That's the creative attitude. What a privilege it is to to 
be given the opportunity to grow closer to God? How can I recreate my enthusiasm moment by moment by moment? There's a point in life, I, to me it came when I was about 50, when I realized that happiness was a choice. And I know that's, you know that's a basic principle of what Swami taught us, but I realized it much deeper in this sense, which is <clears throat> having been given <clears throat> a good karma life and having been blessed with a, a fairly buoyant nature, I never had to work um, to feel light. I mean, I had my ups and downs, of course, but as a, as a rule, I floated. I floated higher on the, on the scale of, of specific gravity, as Swami calls it. But at the age of 50, and that was about the time we were finishing 12 years of litigation, and it had been a pretty rough period for, on many levels. And I realized that my innocent happiness had been taken away by the events of life. I had simply been forced to face the realities of life in this world in a way that I'd managed to avoid up until that point. And I could feel <clears throat> how people get old. I could just feel this energy that was <clears throat> trying to persuade me um, to be just a little bit pulled down all the time. And there was lots of reasons for it. It wasn't like it wasn't even objectively true. But I realized this is a crucial turning point. Either at this point I make the conscious decision to put out the creative energy to find a way to, to keep my spirits upward or else I will gradually simply get old. That's why the, the time was interesting. It's kind of a turning point in life. You're halfway through the century, Mark, and either you begin from that point to get old or you maintain the buoyancy of youth but not automatically by a deliberate decision. That's the creative attitude, that my life is mine to create, my attitude toward my work, my experience of working is mine to create. That's the creative attitude. That's what he's saying. And yes, of course, innovate, improve, um, find new ways to do things, invent. Why not? But it's the creative attitude that Swamiji was encouraging here, not merely um, change for its own sake. So the second paragraph is, those who work with the thought of pay live in the future. They lose the habit of living here and now, where alone true happiness can be found. I know I gave that a lot of energy yesterday, but each time I read it, if you, if you work for pay, you live in the thought of the future. This is, not, this is not really my life. My life begins at another point than this one, but it becomes a habit. Swami talked about being on the subway in New York and seeing people <clears throat> on the subway who were just waiting to reach their destination. Excuse me, I've been having trouble with my voice the last few days. <coughs> He said he saw people on the subway and they were just, um, let's see, how would he put it? They were just waiting for time to pass and they were completely shut down and just waiting. I'm holding my hand like I'm holding the, the strap above on the ceiling there. Um, just waiting for time to pass and when their stop came, they sort of woke up from that stupor. Now you could think there's nothing much interesting to be doing on the subway but the habit of dropping out of your own life cuts grooves in your brain and pretty soon those grooves take over. And it's, it's basically trying to find happiness by lowering your awareness and dulling your sensitivity. And that is the opposite of self-realization. In a circumstance as I was talking about work yesterday, where nothing is pulling you upward then you have to take that as a glorious opportunity to lift your own energy upward. I talked about the woman who prayed for people when she was on the bus. There's always something you can do with your consciousness. 
So the third paragraph, work should always be done as well as possible, not out of self-conceit, but in gratitude for the free gift of life, of sunshine, of water, of air, and in gratitude simply for our God-given power to be useful to our fellow man. Well, I spoke a great deal about making your life useful when uh, I was talking about earlier paragraphs. And we can be grateful to God for the, the gift of life. But there's another reason to do our work as well as possible. And this Swami explains in a particular section in the Bhagavad Gita commentary. He talks about the esoteric understanding that the, this, this material world is composed of three kinds of energy, tamasic energy, rajasic energy, and sattvic energy. And the three of them combine to create the world, the, the world of duality that we live in. <clears throat> tamasic energy is downward pulling. It, it, le- <clears throat> it leads us to, a, to less and less awareness. Um, rajasic energy is active. It's neither expansive nor contractive. It just moves around. And sattvic energy is uplifting. And when we transcend this plane of consciousness, we have mastered the three gunas. We are not being run by them. Most people are run by the gunas. There's always this downward pulling energy, this desire to sleep, to do less, to dull our awareness, whether through food or drink or drugs or whatever it might be, or television or scrolling the internet or all the things that we do that just cause us to pass time without in any way uplifting our energy. Rajasic energy just keeps us moving. We clean the house, we go out for a run, we um, go to the grocery store, we call our friends, we scroll the internet, we just do stuff. It's neither up nor down, it's just running essentially in circles. Sattvic is that which draws us towards superconsciousness. Always, when we fail to do a good job, it's either because we've just restlessly moved about without accomplishing anything, or we've allowed ourselves to fall into low and, and contractive energy. So excellence is actually the proof of our being able to master within ourselves these three levels of energy and use our active rajasic energy to move us in a sattvic and or uplifted direction. And this is why work should be done as good as possible because it is ourselves that we are building. Because all work, everything we do in this world, the moment we die, it's gone. But our consciousness remains. So what we have, co- ha- what we have become in our consciousness, from the work we have done, that is our true work in this world. So all work should be done as well as possible, which means all work should be used to develop our consciousness. And it's a beautiful thought, in gratitude for the gift of life and the opportunity to make this world better, as I talked about yesterday, by adding our uplifting consciousness to the vibrations of the planet. So now let's move on um, to the affirmation related to work. And it is very simple. I will do my work thinking of thee, Lord. I offer to thee the very best that is in me. Now this affirmation relates to we should do our work as well as possible in gratitude for the gift of life. We We are on a mission we, we are not here for egoic reasons. Our soul, our superconscious self, is moving us through this incarnation and all our incarnations with a destiny in mind. You know, it's, this is the gradual realization that comes to us as we study these teachings, as we meditate, as we, as we reflect. We begin to become aware of the fact that you know, that which I think of as myself uh, normally, just the ego-based identity, that your, your name, your cultural condition, your talents, your ethnicity, all of these different things are, are all a superficial overlay 
over this, this deeper soul nature. That's why I was saying at the beginning, the soul, the, the superconscious part of ourself, um, it is the driving force. And, I, and the, the limited self-identity can find fulfillment, at least for a time, in external relations, in fame, in money, in possessions, in power. And it's not that it doesn't have an experience of, oh, I really like this. Self-conceit, Swami calls it when he's talking about work. And, and we have that, and it makes us feel good for a little while. But it's not our true self. There's a deeper self underneath that. So that self has fun on that level, but the deeper self is always, it's like a pulse. It's like a pulse that just won't stop. And when we're trying to tell ourselves that this is good enough, this is working, this money is worth it, I can cut corners to get what I want, and I'll still be fine. And the deeper self just won't allow it. it you may get away with it for a lifetime or two, but the deeper self just won't allow it. St. Augustine, our, we were made for thee alone. And our hearts are restless till we find our rest in thee. It's just a simple fact. So the more we the more we have the courage to acknowledge that. And see, this is what it takes, and it also takes a creative attitude. We have to be creative enough to see past the obvious to the deeper level and the deeper purpose of our lives. And you can't, you can't force this realization on people. You can't force this realization on yourself. It, it's, it's a hunger. It's a hunger for meaning. It's a hunger for purpose that just rises within us. So the affirmation is, I will do my work thinking of thee, Lord. I offer to thee the very best that is in me. The, um, the temple that we have here in Palo Alto for Ananda used to be a Catholic church, and it was built about 1950, you know, 70 years ago now. It's a simple but very beautiful building. <coughs> and in the course of, of remodeling it, refurbishing it inside, to make it look more like the way we wanted to use it, we had to sort of break into some walls and change bits and pieces of it. And the workmen, who were our, our own uh, members, who were doing that work, remarked how extremely well-built the building is, how even somewhat overbuilt it is, more than was absolutely necessary. And, and the, our builders have speculated, which is probably true, that the people who built the church were probably Catholics and very likely people who were involved in the church because at that time a lot of people who were in the construction trades were also Catholics and also lived in the area. And they built it not just for you know the money of the job, but they built it for God. They built it as a, a loving contribution to their spiritual life and the spiritual life of generations to come. And, and the builders can just see that in there. It didn't have to be done this well, but it was done that well because I offer to thee the very best that is in me. When Swamiji was an, a young monk at Mount Washington in Los Angeles, a master at that time was building India Center, which was this additional sort of fellowship hall attached to the Hollywood church there, the church they had in Hollywood. And Swamiji was not at all um, skilled in the, in the construction work that he was doing, but it was what Master wanted him to do, so he, he did his best. And another man, a monk, who was worth, a fellow monk who was working with him, was so conscientious in the way he did things, even inside the walls. And Swami made some comment about, you know, nobody's going to see that. It, it's perfectly adequate without being so aesthetically finished. And the monk answered quite simply, well, God will see it. And 
it was work. They were monks. They were building a work for a spiritual purpose. But that answer is always the true answer. God will see it. And, and even more deeply, God will see into our hearts. And it may matter that the inside wall is finished very beautifully, just for many different reasons. But what God will really see, and, and what is really being finished beautifully, is the attitude of our hearts. Everything should be done as well as it can be done and offered at the feet of the divine. Because that's why we're here. We're here to understand that everything we're doing, we're doing for God. And no matter what the superficial context and compared to our life with life in eternity, in realization of our divine nature, everything else is superficial, no matter how gloriously it may shine in this world. But, but the energy that we put out and the self-mastery that that energy represents, and even more deeply, the awareness that, that the Divine is always with me. Divine Mother is always watching. My Guru is always watching. And if we do everything as an offering, then this whole world becomes completely different. And we also develop the, the habit of concentration, conscientiousness, excellence. I heard, and I don't even know who I was listening to, an interview on the radio with a, a successful author who was an African American, and part of his mission was to go to high schools and elementary schools where many other African American students were. And by the example of his success, and by what he could talk to them about how you achieve success, he wanted to help lift up his own, uh, his own communities, which was a very noble enterprise. And he said in one um, high school he was there, one of the students asked him, how do you become a successful author? And his answer was, excellence is a habit. And I loved that phrase. I thought it was so apt. And especially now that we're talking about work, excellence is a habit. It's not like, oh, I'll just be lazy and unconscientious and careless and half asleep in everything I do, but then suddenly I'll wake up over there when there's something else at stake. No, how you do everything is how you do anything. And even more deeply, don't just wait to bring God into your reality. Make him your constant companion. One of my friends who was very, very successful in business, he always had a, ch a, a chair in his office that he placed in such a way that no one else would, it wasn't convenient for anyone else to sit in it. And he always had Jesus in his awareness sitting in that chair. So there was nothing he ever did in his office, in his business life, talking to anyone on the phone, doing anything, where Jesus wasn't sitting right next to him. And really, if Jesus were sitting right next to you, you would behave very differently, wouldn't you? Well, the fact of the matter, he is. The divine is always with us. I will do my work thinking of thee, Lord. I offer to thee the very best that is in me. And the prayer then. Beloved Lord, who so wonderfully created the high snowy mountains, the bounding rivers, the colorful, fragrant flowers, the vast, heaving oceans, and the distant, glittering stars, manifest through me thy perfect joy. I love that really both of these, both of these, uh, both the affirmation and the prayer for the, for, the, for the section called work. Work is a very mundane, everyday, in the world, kind of practice. It's not, we're not talking devotion, we're not talking love, you know, we're not, we're not talking self-sacrifice, we're just talking work. And yet these are two of the most devotional affirmations and prayers that Swami offered us. I will do my work thinking of thee, I will offer the very best that is in me. And the prayer is first just a peon of appreciation and gratitude and praise you know, Lord, you created the mountains, the flowers, 
the rivers, and he doesn't even just say mountains, flowers, rivers, the wonderfully, um, the high snowy mountains, the bounding rivers, the colorful fragrant flowers, the vast heaving oceans. So we, we have to enter in, not just with our uh, kind of left brain dividing everything up in a kind of neat patterns, but he brings in this, this enormous element of feeling so that we have to think about the vast heaving oceans and the bounding rivers. So they're, they're not inert to us. They're living, they're dynamic. What is Swami showing us? He's giving us a creative attitude. You could just say river, but with a creative attitude, you talk about the bounding rivers. With a creative attitude, you talk about the high snowy peaks. And when you think of the flowers, you think also of their fragrance. And Swamiji is trying to put us in the mood. In, in the, the, word, the right, word, right word for it is bhav. There's no English equivalent exactly. The, the bhav is the way you approach your spiritual life, the way you approach divinity. And Swami's wanting to take the most, the most um, inescapable aspect of human life, which is the necessity to work. I mean, we're talking mostly about working for money, but just in my own house, you know, doing laundry this morning, you know, doing a little bit of cleaning, having to think about making the grocery list, all the things that I was saying, all this work we have to do just to stay alive, you know, unless we have a very different life than the ones that most of us live, we just have to spend all this time doing work. So is that work just mundane? Oh, I have to do the grocery shopping, I have to do the shop, the this, the laundry, the that. I mean, I'm a, a, a creative artist type. I love theater, I love music, I, I love writing, I love words. You know, this is what my nature is, but there's not much I can do with the laundry. I mean, it's just the laundry. But I can, I can adopt a spiritual bhav in, even when I'm approach, approaching the most mundane part of work. So we describe this, this creative, poetic force of the divine, and we say, manifest through me. So it isn't just um, that I can breathe and I can lift the laundry basket. It's that I'm asking that same power that made this gorgeous world in all its beauty and harmony and remarkable, miraculous nature, manifest through me. Let me be a part of creation because God, he's also implying here, God does all this work. I mean, not that we, we don't think of God as, what would you say, struggling. We don't think of him as being bored, which in and of itself is an interesting point, isn't it? He wasn't bored when he manifested the fragrant flowers. There's no strain involved in the flow of divine energy. It's a spontaneous outpouring of divine love. And that's what we're asking. Manifest in me. You know, make my life like the fragrant flowers and the bounding rivers and the high snowing pe snowy peaks. It may seem like a stretch when you're at the grocery store filling your basket, but if I do everything thinking of God and offer God the best that is in me, then he can manifest through us his perfect joy. God bless you.